Christine, I am so excited to have you here on Confidence Conversations today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for having me. I'm really excited to be here as well. Yeah. So tell me, before we get into all of the incredible advocacy and philanthropic work that you're currently doing, what does confidence mean to you? That's a fabulous question. Uh, Confidence to me means having the empowerment and the trust in yourself to do the things that you think that you wouldn't be able to do. It's not just, you know, being able to walk into that crowded room and make new friends, but it's also knowing that you have the skills and the ability to go after your goals and dreams and to do what you want and that you can that you can do them without being afraid of failure, but knowing that even though failure might happen, that you're still confident enough and you have the ability and the trust within yourself to go after them anyway. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I think we all have our own unique skills and abilities that we're born with, right? We have these innate qualities about us, but depending on our upbringing and the surrounding circumstances, some of us have those things, you know, really nourished and, you know, our parents advocate for us and that we're really, you know, sowing that seed of success. And then other times we're left to feel like, you know, I don't have any qualities or abilities. So can you tell me about where you were on that spectrum growing Mm -hmm. up? Absolutely. And that's another great question. So I was born with a bilateral cleft lip and palate, which basically meant my lip and my palate did not properly close. I needed more than 20 surgeries to repair my lip. And as a result, I have scars, uh, you know, on my upper lip. And so I grew up with a facial difference, being bullied, people telling me that I didn't look pretty enough. I wasn't good enough. Teachers telling me I'll never amount to anything because of the school I missed and, you know, the stereotype that because I had a facial scar, I was dumb and stupid and would never do anything. So that tipped away at what, a, what little confidence I normally had or a child normally has when they're born. Because as you know, when children are born, they develop their personality. That's when usually confidence is developed, either by the family, their environment, or all of the above. So I really didn't have that confidence. I thought I did. And I what I learned later on was that it was just kind of my way of hiding and denying myself, denying who I was. But I didn't really have the confidence that I was good enough or that I could go out and do the things that I wanted. My mother t- kept telling me that I was normal, just like all the other children, which kind of created this uh, conflict in me because I knew I wasn't normal. Being bullied and being told that I looked different and not having friends, I knew I wasn't normal. So as a result of not having that confidence, it just really left me feeling lost, not knowing who I was, and really afraid to go out and do anything. Instead, what I did to compensate was I just kind of pretend I was was whomever anybody wanted me to be, whether, you know, that was just a friend, um, you know, a companion. And I did whatever anybody wanted. I became a people pleaser. And that was kind of how I survived for the longest time. Yeah. Oprah calls it the disease to please. Yes. I think a lot of us experience that in different forms and fashions throughout our life. And it really is this deep rooted, I think it is a a dis-ease in a sense of dis-ease. We're not at ease. And so that manifests itself in terms of us trying to overcompensate and prove our worth or value by making sure that the people around us are comfortable or at least happy with who we are. So what, Mm -hmm. before we even talk about, you know, how did you get out of the disease to please, how did you even become aware that you had it? Mm -hmm. Wow. It was, I, it wasn't until I was in my late forties that I really realized I didn't have the confidence. Um, it actually started, I guess, a little bit earlier when I was going through a divorce. My ex-husband, I was in an abusive marriage, um, and you know, I was again afraid to leave the marriage for a number of reasons, thinking I couldn't make it on my own. I would never, you know, be good enough. Nobody else would ever want me. I got married because at the time I thought it was my only option. You know, here's somebody that wanted to marry me. I didn't exactly have a line of uh, shooters knocking on my door. So I, I you know, took what I could. And when I was going through the divorce, um, I started to realize that, wow, I really didn't have the confidence, but I was starting to build it because I knew 
if I didn't, it was not going to end well for me. You know, it was going to be very difficult living that way. So it was through a lot of help, a lot of self-help development work. I had a lot of extensive therapy, but it was also learning about how to manage my emotions and how to interact with people and a lot of mindfulness, being present, and a lot of also learning how to manage when we get those distressing moments, when we get those triggers of either childhood trauma or something that is really so upsetting, how to work through that. Because what I learned is that if I can manage my emotions, not push them away as I always did, but really learn to identify them, name them, and realize that they have a purpose, it left me feeling more empowered and more confident that, okay, I can handle anything that comes my way. Uh, that's not to say I, I don't get scared and I don't get upset. I still do, if anything. I, I feel the emotions much more deeper now and much stronger because I'm aware of them. But knowing that I have the tools and I have the skills to work through them, work through the distressing times or work through a conflict with someone else or interact with someone else a little bit better helps me feel more confident. So mm -hmm. with the help of therapy and um, you know working on myself, and realizing that I have so much to give and I have so much within me, that was how I started to build my confidence. I really like that. And you, you mentioned a lot here, but you mentioned the tools, right? The therapy, doing the work, but you made a really powerful statement, which is that our emotions are there for a reason. Mm -hmm. they, they have a purpose. And mm -hmm. so often, just like you, so many of us, try to, whether it's that we just don't want to reconcile with our emotions or feel what we're feeling, or we're in a really like a state of denial and just, you know, repress and suppress those emotions. There's a part of us that doesn't want to feel that it's like, I've got to be productive. I've got to get through the day. I don't have time to say mm -hmm. hi, <laughs> or it's, you know, I'm supposed to be strong. I have to be strong. And feeling this sadness or rejection or whatever those, those emotions are, that doesn't resonate with this identity that I have for myself or who I need to be. But I want to understand when you were going through that process, sitting with your feelings and recognize that your emotions have a role in your opinion, what is the role of our emotions and what can they tell us about ourselves other than just how we feel? Mm -hmm. And that's a great question. And just to build on what you said uh, in the beginning, yeah, I, I lived most of my life thinking that I couldn't show weakness. My mother all, always told me, oh, don't cry, you know, um, you know, strong girls don't cry, believing that I had to be strong, believing that I had to hide my feelings, because if I did cry, it would show the weakness. So yeah, just like you said, we, we learn from an early age to stuff our emotions, to ignore them pretend they don't exist so when I said that emotions have a purpose there is information for us it's telling us that something is not quite right not necessarily wrong just you know that something is happening that makes us sad or something happens that makes us angry or something is happening that makes us happy and it's important to embrace them because they are part of humanity they're part of who we are they're part of our person and what I learned the hard way is that if you don't acknowledge and let those emotions exist, if you stuff them away, they come back with a vengeance tenfold. And mostly when you least expect it and when you don't want them to. And when they come back with that vengeance, there is no way you're going to be able to get rid of them. So what I learned in dealing with the emotions and, and actually coming to terms with accepting them, it was, it was difficult. It was definitely very painful. Um, it was, I had to take it in small steps. And that's what I would recommend to anybody first being aware of the emotions. I had to learn how to name them because I never knew what they were. I could describe a feeling, but I didn't know, oh, that feeling of fear is really anxiety or that feeling of achiness and wanting to hide under a rock is shame or that feeling of like, I can't stop crying, it's sadness. And so I had to really be able to name them and then tell myself it's okay to feel that way. You know, maybe I, I mean, at times I use skills I learned so that I wouldn't burst out into tears in the middle of a meeting or, you know, in an inappropriate time. And in that case, it is okay to shove them away for that moment. If it's not appropriate, you're not going to have a crying outburst while driving. It's not safe. But then I realized, okay, you know, I'll put it in a drawer, come back to it later, and then process it, bring up that thought, whatever it was, and process it. 
And the most important thing I learned throughout the, the years of working with my emotions, sitting with them, is that emotions only last 90 seconds. Physiologically, in our body, the feeling of whatever the emotion is, is only 90 seconds. So if you can kind of tolerate it for 90 seconds, it'll pass, just like a wave in the ocean. And then another emotion will come, or maybe just you won't feel anything in the moment, or you'll feel calm. But yeah, that's, that's the other thing I learned that I'd like to care. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think it's so important to get curious about the way that our emotions are manifesting and to notice patterns of when we are feeling certain things. Um, and I realize this for myself in doing a lot of like um, inner child work and looking back at some of the things that I didn't even know impacted me until the to this day, right? And like taking a step back and thinking about I actually feel fine right now. Like nothing, nothing in my environment is causing me to feel scared, anxious. It's not work or anything going on. Um, but I have this anxiety or this feeling of fear, like deep down, where the heck is it coming from? Mm -hmm. And in doing that work and digging deep and going through like each stage of your life, you're able to realize that sometimes anxiety, stress, feelings of sadness are stagnant energy inside of you that even if you didn't recognize that you pushed it down, it was something that never really got addressed. And there could be the most minute trigger, like a scent that was present mm -hmm. at the same time. Or like maybe someone in a traumatic situation was wearing a green shirt and you saw a green shirt and you don't even put the, you don't even have the like conscious memory or awareness that that even happened. You don't remember a person in a green shirt, but your subconscious mind does. And so you see that and you're, you're triggered and you don't even know where it comes from. And I think mm -hmm. getting really curious about that and noticing the patterns and being fully present is a part of what helps us like really do that, like mm -hmm. unpacking work. Absolutely. And, and you made a very good point mentioning that the emotions and the triggering emotions are stuck inside our body and in our subconscious. And they are. There's been a lot of research done, particularly about um, thinking of called Waking the Tiger. I think the author is Peter Levine, where he mentions how our body holds on to the trauma that we experience as children and that we can continue on with our lives and be functional. Our, our minds know how to lock away that trauma so that we can cope. You know, our minds are really, I mean, they're a powerful uh, physical part of us that just really protects us. But yeah, I mean, we can have that, you know, triggering for me at certain sense, especially like in hospitals mm -hmm. uh, that can send me back where I feel that panic and I feel that anxiety and I feel that abandonment. And so that's where the mindfulness comes in, learning how to be present in the moment, uh, skills that I've learned, and also being able to tolerate that distressing moment and you know, doing either a distracting technique, like, you know, holding onto an ice cube, thinking of something pleasant, uh, maybe playing some music, something that'll temporarily break that cycle, break that thought in your mind until you can then get to a place where you can actually process that trigger or process that uh, emotion of the fear, the anxiety. Yeah. And I know when we talked before, you mentioned a, a huge part of your journey was after your divorce, where you were really doing the work on yourself. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about what that process looked like and what you learned about yourself in, mm -hmm. in that process. Thank you. Yeah. So it was a really long journey and it's still, uh, I like to give it still a work in process. I'm still on the journey. But what I learned is that I'm a lot stronger than I think I am. And I have a lot more to offer than I think I did. And that's something that a lot of people have told me. And I started to realize on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned that my experiences all brought me to where I am today and who I am today. Uh, you know, and being born with a cleft lip and power facial difference, all the bullying, all the surgeries helped me build resilience and compassion. So those were some of the things that I learned along the way. I also learned, uh, you know, throughout my journey, how to just, how to, how to dig deep and how to have that strong confidence within myself that I am able to go ahead and overcome any obstacles that come my way and get through them. Mm -hmm. And now you are able to help others find their way. I know you do work with the smile train, you've given mm -hmm. TED talks, etc. 
tell me about what that work looks like for you, because it's, you've gone through the process of having to navigate your challenge with cleft lip and palate. And now you're able to, to give back Mm -hmm. to others. So what are some of the challenges that you faced and experienced because of that? And how now are you giving back to others? Absolutely. So um, I, I, I'm, I work as a confidence and transformation coach. So I work mostly with clients who have facial differences, but I also work with anybody who wants to build their confidence, who wants to feel better about themselves, who has feels like they have low self-esteem, low confidence, that they don't feel like they're good enough. So I help them to realize the strengths and the beauty that they have within and their positive qualities that they have so much to offer. Some of the obstacles that I went through was, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of bullying, uh, both as a child and even as an adult, especially in the workplace, uh, being told that I'm not qualified for a job because of either my speech or how I look or thinking that I wasn't as intelligent as I was, um, you know, just getting through that, especially a lot of insecurity in meeting people was something else I had to work through. So what I do is when I work with my clients, I draw on my own experiences and the skills I developed to overcome them, to share with the clients that they can overcome those challenges as well, especially with social anxiety. That was a big obstacle I had to overcome was, feeling like if I walk in a room, everybody's going to stare at me and laugh at me. Or if I say something, they were going to laugh at how I talk. And that was almost to the point of being paralyzing where I didn't want to do anything or to help me, you know, because I did work in business and I had to interact with people. I would just pretend I was normal. And of course, pretending that you're something you're not never worked. So when I work with the clients also, especially with social anxiety, I help them understand that their fear is real and it's validated but it's also not most likely not going to come true and if people do laugh at them it doesn't define who they are that's the biggest thing that I learned and that I share with my clients is that what other people think of us does not define who we are does not change who we are Mm -hmm. that's so beautiful and it couldn't be more true right Mm -hmm. because no fully healed fully confident, fully aware person is going out to hurt others. Right. However, words do have the power to hurt us. And so when we're hearing that, I think it's so important for people to realize that hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. It is not in any way, shape or form a reflection of you because no one in their right mind would be disparaging in any way to anyone else. And so I think just identifying that as well, because we all have our own unique layers of diversity and differences, and some are more visible than others, but anyone who's fully conscious and aware is not disparaging others because of anything (laughs) that they're going through. So how do you help your, your, your um, clients realize that? Because it's one thing to say, right? Like it's okay. Mm -hmm. you know, you're great, but how do you get them to believe that? Because it's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to embody it. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I do is I also help them understand where those disparaging comments are coming from. And nearly all of the time, whenever anybody says something hurtful, it's usually out of fear. It's, and, and we fear what we don't know. So when people see someone with scars on their lip or a facial difference or, you know, it could be any number of things that someone makes a a disparaging comment over, it's because they're afraid that that other person is different and looks different. And it's that cognitive dissonance that, hey, this person doesn't look like me and therefore I I need to be afraid of them. And then suddenly it's also what comes from a lack of knowledge that the other person is not knowledgeable in the differences in our humanity and, and our society. So I, help, I first of all let people know and tell my clients that, look, you know, those comments hurtful, they come from a place of fear. And so if they can understand and at least acknowledge that and realize that it's not personal, even though it feels personal, mm-hmm. I let them know that sometimes understanding the origin helps them realize, okay, it's not really about me. It's more about the other person and their lack of knowledge and their fear. And then I help my clients realize what they do have, what they've accomplished, what they can, what 
their qualities are, their positive qualities. We usually try to do that by finding something that they like about themselves, whether it's their intellect, whether it's their hair, another uh, physical attribute that they like. And then we focus on that. Well, also, I, I help them develop the skills that I've learned of feeling confident, knowing how to interact with people. Because I feel like if you can interact with someone and know what to say, how to say it, how to understand people, then there's less fear and anxiety within that you're going to say something wrong. Or, yeah. or you get to that point where if you do say something wrong or if you do make a mistake and you say something that's a little embarrassing, you realize that it's okay because we're human and it still doesn't define who we are. So the biggest thing I do is I want to help my clients realize who they are, what they have to offer and the beautiful qualities that they possess within them. I love that. And I think, you know, we offer so much grace and acceptance to others, but when we're able to turn that around and give it to ourselves, it can be so liberating. Mm -hmm. Yes. So tell me about how your life has changed since you started doing work with Smile Train and investing the time and energy into yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a, a really fabulous and uh, I guess intense journey. It's only been within the last five or six years that I've actually started on this path of uh, working with Smile Train and working, you know, really developing and improving myself. But it's been, like I said, a very empowering five years. Uh, I find that I. Well, first of all, I, I know that I'm more confident. I feel more confident. I like the person that I've become. I have traveled to Kenya to meet with people, the children there that were beneficiaries of smile train surgeries. I've also traveled to Colombia. I've met so many fabulous people. Uh, you know, through my TED talk, I was able to share and educate what it was like growing up with a cleft lip and palate, the challenges and that, I, that I've overcome. And I guess most importantly, my, my life has changed in that I'm now advocating for the community, educating society about cleft and palate, what it means, challenges that we grow up that we grow up with, and helping other people realize who they are and what they have to offer, and that they don't have to live uh, feeling like they're hidden away, that they're unworthy. Uh, most of all, I really I I enjoy feeling the empowerment and the confidence that I develop within myself to go after my dreams and go after my goals and just know that I'm making the world a better place. Yeah. And it's so interesting because I think a lot of times we experience this in that what we perceive to be our pain in one season is our purpose for the rest of our lives. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yes. I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't gone through what I did as a child, teenager, growing up. Uh, all of those experiences helped to shape me who I am. And as painful as they were, and you know, I definitely wouldn't want to repeat them and wouldn't wish them on anybody. I know that I was, I, I know that I was given those challenges because I could handle them. And I deep down inside, I had the resources to handle them. And so having gone through all of those gave me the gift to be able to give back and help others get through the same similar challenges that I went through. Yeah. So uh, you know, if I could tell my, my younger self something, uh, uh, a piece of advice, you know, and I always like to think about what would I have told my eight-year-old, 10-year-old, even 14-year-old self is that what I was going through was for a reason. And there will be, you know, a time in the future, like, now, you know, now that I can give back and that what I've learned and what I went through is going to be, give me the ability to give back to help others, which is really what I love doing the most is helping others. Yeah. I think, you know, we talked about the tools and the resources and the coaching and the positive self-work as all being a really important part of that process. And I think one of the other things that's so important is our relationships and the people that we surround ourselves with. So tell me about like how your sense of community has evolved over time and how you view relationships differently, because I know like your relationship with your mom and your ex-husband were very formative in a mm -hmm. way breaking the mold and the patterns of thinking from some of those tumultuous relationships can be difficult, but we have to go through that to learn about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. So when I was, you know, in the relationship with my ex-husband and even with my mother, I didn't know who I was. I was constant. I was constantly tap dancing. I was, you know, the good wife to my ex-husband. I was the good daughter to my mother. Uh, my mother was very narcissistic. She was very controlling and she kind of wanted me to be in her image. And 
I was also a people pleaser because I had the self-confidence growing up. I did whatever she wanted me to do. I was whoever she, I thought she wanted me to be. So living from that place of being a people pleaser, it's not fun. Although we don't realize it at the time, it's one of those situations where once you're removed and you've changed enough, you can look back and say, oh, wow, that's how I was. And what I've learned is that I did what I had to to survive. I, tr- I don't judge it anymore. I used to judge it. I still hold a lot of self-judgment. And that's one of my laws that I'm working through. But what I've learned is that I did what I had to to survive. And there was nothing wrong with that. We all do that. But the way my relationship has changed is because I feel more confident and I am more confident. I don't people please anymore. I can speak up and ask for what I want. I know how to set boundaries. I make sure that my voice is heard. I also know what a, what a healthy compromise is rather than what I've always believed that especially in marriage where, uh, you know, you're supposed to do everything for your spouse because that's what marriage is, but they never did anything for you. But I always thought, okay, you know, they'll reciprocate at some point in the future. I want to now know that, that was just me not having boundaries, mm-hmm. me not, you know, knowing that, hey, you know, it's a two-way street. And I've also learned my relationships have mostly changed in that I asked well, I ask for what I want. I set the boundaries. And I know I have I have my own values now where I know what I will and will not compromise on. That's mm-hmm. the biggest thing. And all of those things combined helped me feel more confident. Uh, it came from developing my own confidence and having the confidence to ask for what I want and say no and say, nope, this is what I'll do. This is what I will not do. Mm-hmm. You know, I I grew up in a a similar situation and it it can be really hard as an adult to be able to set those boundaries and speak up about what you want and to have expectations, reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. Expectations of others um, when you didn't grow up in an environment where you, you had that or could express that. And so I found, at least in my situation, that although what I was going through was not fun it was not comfortable. I did not like it. I stayed in because it was familiar Mm -hmm. and that was my baseline and I didn't know any different. And so for me, that was what love in air quotes was. Mm -hmm. That is how caring for someone manifested itself. And it was a very toxic manifestation um, where you give, 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 and you you know, you're walking on eggshells and trying to please and look out, but not understanding that not only like you can recognize in others, right. That like, that's not healthy. He's not good, mm-hmm. whatever. But like when you're in it for yourself, there's so many excuses and this is why my situation is different. And that's kind of what I struggled with. And so after finally getting out of that situation and realizing like, what the heck, like, why did I stay there? And that's where looking back really served me because it was like, this happened. It was horrible. Um, but also I stayed in it. And that was the question I had to ask myself of like, why, why was I there as long as I was given how bad it was? And I think when we're able to be like really honest about ourselves, and it's not placing blame on ourselves because we're, we're not to blame, Mm -hmm. but really be honest about what role did I play in this? What, you know, cognitive dissonance was going on? Like what excuses was, was I making? And then ask why? And I think there's so much grace in the why, right? Mm-hmm. So much grace. We begin to understand ourselves and begin to be able to embrace ourselves. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, like, you know, like we talked about our situations are similar. You know, I stayed in the abusive marriage for more than 10 years before I was able to get out. And it was only an accident that forced me to leave the marriage. If not for the well, you know, motorcycle accident I was in, I probably would have still stayed married. Um, and so, you know, and, and in the time since I div- my divorce, I did look back a lot and say, well, why did I stay there? And you're right, being honest with ourselves, looking at it with curiosity, not with blame or shame or judgment, but rather understanding our motives, understanding who we, who we are, helps us realize and learn so that we can go forward. For me, I stayed in the marriage because I didn't think I was going to be able to do anything else. I didn't think I was going to be able to find anybody else. I was afraid and I got the confidence to go off on my own. And I 
what I realized too is that I didn't have enough self worth to realize that I deserved someone better or even nobody at all. And that's what I've learned over the years that it was it's better to be single and it's okay to be single than to be in a toxic relationship because at least when I'm single, I can take care of myself. And being in that toxic relationship, there was no no taking care of myself. But a lot of that, what I've learned is just from a place of feeling unworthy and needing love and acceptance, no matter how I got it. And it was what I did to what I did to survive to get through. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, again, it's not with shame. And I think that a lot of people with facial differences, and even those without those facial differences, who just grew up in an environment where they weren't nurtured as children, they weren't loved, they didn't have that acceptance in their home life, they look for those relationships. And it's sad, but it's also their way of coping, which is understandable. And, you know, it's, it's hard to get out of that when you're in that position. Again, like you said, you've asked yourself why you've looked at it. And when you understand it, it's like, oh, okay, you know, that was the best I can do at the time. And sometimes it's just we have to go through that trial by fire to get to where we are, to get to the stronger people we are today. It's so true. And I think just knowing that it's okay at the tail end of it, because that was what I was sitting in for a while um, was like that sense of shame of like, what the heck? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Why were you there? What were you doing? How could you? And then, you know, as with what comes with narcissistic relationships, trying to like peel back the layers of the trauma and like Mm -hmm. what actually did go on and realizing also it's not my job to try to figure out what did go on. That was the past. What I need Mm -hmm. to understand is like, how do I move forward? Cause you mentioned we did what we have to do to survive. And my interest as a human being, isn't just to survive it's to thrive. So how do I get out of this survival mode? Right. To now get to a point of self-acceptance, inner peace, and self-actualization. So mm-hmm. what does self-actualization look like for you and how are you thriving today? Oh, wow, well, that's a good question. So self-actualization for me looks like it's a lot of self-care. It's a lot of really figuring out what I need, what I enjoy, um, you know, and, and in many ways, I feel like I'm back being a teenager again, figuring out who I am and what I like. And wanting to do the things that I didn't wasn't able to do as a teenager because either I was tied up with doctor appointments or you know doing whatever my mother wanted or just going to school and not having that freedom. So self actualization today is continuing on my path of learning who I am, figuring out who I am, what my strengths are, what I like and don't like, what my values are. That's a big part of it, and I do that through a lot of self care, meditating, taking time for myself giving myself a lot of grace and leeway and saying, you know, what I did in the past, the choices I made, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's done. I can't change it. I can learn from it. And it's okay. It doesn't change who I am in my heart and soul, you know, compassionate and empathetic and helpful. And so, uh, you know, continuing on the path of self-development, I continue working on myself. I continue observing uh, my actions, my thoughts, my emotions, and through that observation, and then being able to describe it is how I continue to really move forward and and learn about myself. That's amazing. And you've given us so many gems and jewels and transparency during this conversation. But I want to know if you have any final words of wisdom for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, you mentioned self-acceptance. And I think that self-acceptance is difficult to achieve but everybody has the ability to reach it. And it's really just being okay with who we are in that present moment, because everybody is good. I believe everybody has some good in them. Everybody has grace in them. And just being gentle with yourself. Practicing that self-acceptance and realizing that we have so much to offer and that we are good and we are worthy. And it's just a matter of finding people who realize that we're worthy and that we don't have to go out and look for it if we can believe it within ourselves. And if we can believe and, and really build in ourselves that we have that self acceptance, we have that goodness to give, we'll get it back tenfold. Yeah. Well, thank you so, so much for joining me on Confidence Conversations today. I've really enjoyed talking to you. You're very welcome, Jocelyn. And thank you so much for having me. Talk to you soon. Yes.